Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here. I'm glad you're here. The Lord is glad you're here. If you would, grab your Bible, turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, we begin a new series of sermons. We're going to be working through the book of James over the next uh, several weeks. I'm calling it Real Faith, because that's really what James is after. As he writes to these uh, Christians, these Jewish Christians, and he's exhorting them and encouraging them to have a real, genuine faith. And what does that look like? And so James explores a a number of different facets of the Christian life uh, that, again, we'll see and we'll pick up and discuss as we go along through this. I want us to read the first four verses. James chapter 1, 1 through 4. Hear now the word of the true and living God. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Let us pray. Lord God, You are the one in whom we believe. We pray that You would, by Your Spirit within us, continue to develop within us a deep and real and genuine faith and that You would do this through Your Word. And So open to us these words that James wrote so many years ago and show us how They are still just as relevant today to us as we seek to live in a pain-filled world. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. There is an inclination in our own cultural setting and situation to avoid pain at all costs. I believe there is even built into our own country that drive to avoid pain. One of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, once said that the goal of life is the avoidance of pain. And and we do have a number of ways in which we can avoid pain in our lives. Got a headache? Got some kind of pain in your body? Take a pill. Don't like the job you have, the employee that is just bothering you on the job, an employee who's being uh, a pain to you? Well, quit and go do something else. This avoidance of pain is the antithesis of what James is talking about. He doesn't say, when you run into various trials, you meet various kinds of trials, run. He says, count it all joy. But the way to the road of joy, even in the midst of trials, must go through verse 1. And I've already, uh, on the Monday night broadcast this last week, I've done an introduction to the epistle of James. If you want a a, a deeper uh, dive into who wrote it, to whom it was written, why, occasion and purpose, and things like that, that video is available on the Davis Park Church of Christ YouTube channel, and you you can go and watch that. But just briefly... You do need verse 1 if verses 2 through 4 are going to make sense. Because James, and I believe this is the half-brother of our Lord, he's writing to these Jewish Christians, 12 tribes in the dispersion. These Jewish Christians scattered all throughout the Roman Empire. And how does he identify himself? He could have leaned into that 
genealogical connection to Jesus. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm Jesus' brother, right? That's why you ought to listen to me. This James, I'm persuaded, was also a bishop in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem church. That's a, a position of authority. He could have leaned into that and said, you know, pull rank here, right? I am a bishop. You ought to listen to me. But he doesn't identify himself in any of those roles. He says, a servant, literally a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a slave, notice, of two masters. But wait a minute, our Lord, didn't He teach you can't serve two masters? This flows very nicely when we recognize actually these two are one. It is God, and this seems to be the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ who is the Son. And within the framework of a Trinitarian understanding of God, yeah, we serve one God who has existed eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And James says, I am slave of that God. But I'm a slave to other slaves. I'm a servant of other servants. I, here he is serving the body, the church, fellow Christians. And he does so by writing this epistle to them. You see, a, a slave is one who has an attitude which seeks to willingly obey the master. And James really is just stepping into a role that all of the great Christians uh, uh, throughout history, all the great people of God in the Old Covenant as well, they all identified themselves. Go through Moses and David and Abraham and all these. They were first and foremost slaves of God. Even the Lord Jesus Christ willingly took on the form of a slave. Became obedient even to the point of death. Even death on the cross. So Christ as our example. The fellow saints as our example. And we... Look, there is no higher calling. And indeed, we, we can go through all the various identifiers of Christians. We are priests. We are uh, kings, a kingdom of priests. We are children of the Most High God. And yet, the spirit of a slave runs throughout all of those where we render simple, willing obedience to God in all things. He knows best. He's the one who is seeing to it that my life falls out according to His will. And so, when I experience trials of various kinds, these are things that have already passed through the loving, merciful hand of my God in heaven. So to complain, to complain... No, no, no. We find elsewhere in Scripture in Philippians 2 that we are to do all things without grumbling or complaining. And so there, there's no hint here of complaining when you meet various kinds of trials. In fact, complaining, would you'd have to mix that with whatever joy is being bound upon us here, and that's not what James is after. He's not talking about a joy that is mixed with sorrow, or hurt feelings, or anger, or bitterness, or complaint. It is unmixed joy. Pure joy. Even in the midst of various kinds of trials. And so yes, we, we count it all joy. And in fact, there's a, a little bit of a play on words here that uh, it doesn't jump off the page at us in uh, the translation here, but in the original language, it really does pop. The uh, word there at the end of verse 1, greetings, it's like a, like a, a happy hello, okay? The word that's used there, not only does it, have a, does it sound like the, the word that is used for joy in verse 2, 
But I, there, there is a relation here uh, between the, 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 the greeting with gladness and then on the other hand, the joy that we are to experience even in the midst of various trials. And, and so that's, uh, that's going to show up again and again as we go through the book of James. He's, he's a, a master, sk- very skilled in language and, and rhetoric and things like that. But also, we're going to see He's a master of the Scriptures. He's going to weave in a number of uh, allusions to Old Testament passages, a number of figures that are going to show up as we go through the book of James. He writes here to my brothers. Not only are they related to him physically as Jewish people, but of course there's that greater spiritual heritage in Christ. They are part of the family of God. And indeed, that's, that's who we are today. We're part of the family of God. We are part of that spiritual heritage. And so, what was good for these Christians in the first century, likewise is good for us. I've entitled this sermon, The Paradox of Pain. Because you do see a bit of the paradox here, don't you? You probably already feel it as we've worked through just a bit of this. You have the various kinds of trials that do bring their pain. And yet, we're to have joy. We're to count those as joy. And by the way, it's not once you've got through them, you can kind of look back and then with joyful reflection see, ah, I see. When you meet face to face, when you're in the midst of those various trials, and and the word there for various, uh, it it carries the idea of uh, a variety of sources and a variety of kinds. This word is used in other contexts to talk about uh, various um, colors, many colors. And so every shade and every hue of trial you meet, you encounter, you count it, you reckon it, you consider it with joy. And again, immediately that may strike us as strange. Joy in the midst of trials of various kinds. Trials are, that's, that's the pressure. All right? there's, there's pressure being applied to us. We're in the crucible. How can we count it as joy? Well, he continues in verse 3 to explain. He says, For you know, and the knowledge here is one that is gained through experience. James here is writing to these fellow Christians who themselves have already experienced trials. And and so he's saying, look, you've experienced trials in the past, and you know, based on that experience, that what this results in is the testing of your faith producing steadfastness. Or your translation may say patience. That's good too. Perseverance, another good word. Steadfastness, perseverance, patience is the product of the testing of your faith. And, and this is something that, that every parent who has raised a child, and we're doing it in our household, that's one of the things that we are, are seeking to stress with our kids is, look, it can't be mom and dad's faith. It's got to be your own faith. And that faith sometimes, yes, it is tested by the, the various kinds of trials. The, the manifold, the, the, if you're working with an older translation, the diverse trials that you face but the purpose for that is the testing of the genuineness of a christian's faith if you turn over just a few pages to the right to first peter the very next book book peter writing to different audience still christians he makes a similar statement He says in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7, he says, In this you rejoice, there's your joy, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ is, of course, when he comes back, the end of time. But to persevere patiently with steadfastness toward that goal, your faith is tested here in this life. So Peter and James, they, they're in agreement about this joyful experience of various trials, the testing of your faith. And again, if we talked a little bit about this on, on Wednesday evening as we we're working our way through the Psalms. You know, if, if uh, your view of God is such that He um, may be caught flat-footed or surprised by the things that are going on in this world, that, that people can actually thwart His purpose and His will in this world, the testing of your faith through trials may not make a lot of sense. Or it may drive you to despair. But if your view of God is the same as James's view of God, who, again, he knows the Old Testament Scriptures, he, he knows that the purposes and the counsel of God can never be thwarted, can never be undone, never be brought to nothing, never frustrated, that in fact, these various kinds of trials are part of the very will of God for my life. And that they have first passed through the gracious and merciful hand of my Father in heaven. Well, then I can recognize these various kinds of trials as coming from Him and I can rejoice that I was counted worthy to experience these things. That they're not a, a bad thing, but indeed they are a good thing from a good God. We're going to see in verse 17 that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And I believe the same thing is true for those various kinds of trials. They produce steadfastness, perseverance, patience, endurance. That's the testing of our faith. And so, kind of pulling this all together, just a, a few points for us to consider when it comes to the trials that we experience in our life. That God even may bring these trials and these tests. The first thing is the nature of these trials. You see, God's aim in these trials, though they may cause us pain, they may bring affliction, suffering, God's aim is not to destroy us. His aim is to test. What was the imagery that Peter used? It's like gold in a furnace, gold in the crucible that is... That it's not, the gold isn't consumed, but whatever dross and whatever impurities are on the gold, those are burned away. And what remains is the pure gold. That's what God is after. Right? You, you've probably heard uh, the, the old story about the refiner who, who would put uh, the gold into the furnace and would sit there and watch, and someone came up and said, well, how do you know when it's done? And he says, when I can see my face in it. And that that's akin to what God does, is when He can see His reflection in us, that is when uh, He brings us out of the crucible. Now God is not, His aim is not to destroy, not to consume us, but the testing is for purification. The unbeliever may look at trials, and they do look at trials, it's a disaster, what are we going to do? And their hair's on fire, and they're pulling it out, and all this stuff, and and, and they have to face it without the hope and the confidence that there's a good God in heaven who brought this. They're merely the, whatever pain and whatever suffering is in this world is just the, the product of random, purposeless chance. It's a disaster. But for the godly person, for the Christian, we recognize that these have a purpose. It, it's, it's akin to what we saw in the book of Daniel. We uh, finished our study of the book of Daniel uh, several weeks ago. But let me just remind you, in Daniel chapter 11, there's this extended prophecy, very detailed, about events that were going to come 
in a few centuries after Daniel. And it was going to bring intense suffering and persecution upon the Jewish people, specifically through one really bad ruler named Antiochus Epiphanes IV. But one of the things that is said in Daniel 11, verses 34 and 35, it, it talks about uh, verse 33 also. There are wise among the people, and they're going to have understanding. But then there are going to be others who are going to stumble, and, and they'll receive a, a little help. Uh, verse 34, many shall join themselves to them with flattery. Verse 35, and some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. There's the refinement process. And and whatever trials may come that may uh, uh, bring some stumbling even, the intention with God is for refinement and purification. That's the nature of these. That's what God is after Uh, Not only to uh, show us approved, but also to improve us. You see, that's what James is after in, in, in the grand scheme of the New Testament. And this is part of the reason why people uh, misunderstand and, and think Paul and James are kind of going heads up with one another. Because on the one hand, Paul, and you read like Romans and Galatians, he talks about no one's justified by works of the law. You're justified by faith, even Abraham was justified by his faith. But then you read James, and he's like, well, uh, you know, Abraham was justified by works, right? And, and, and people, again, just at a, at a blush, at first glance, oh man, they're going heads up. Paul and James disagree. That simply isn't the case. Paul, especially early in his epistles, the early parts of his epistles, he's dealing with our justification before God. In, in, in relation to our faith. That yes, we are justified by faith, and then you read the back half of his epistles, and he's, he's talking about, now here's what it looks like as you live out of a justified position. That's what James is writing about. He's, he's the second half of a, an epistle from Paul. He just, he's, kinda, he's assuming that his readers know about justification by faith, and now he's saying, look, yeah, of, of course, uh, of faith that, uh, that, we are, uh, that we stand justified before God with is never alone. Of course there's going to be works. He, James is dealing with the sanctification of the saint and the ongoing process of that. And part of our sanctification, we see here in verses 2 through 4, is those trials of various kinds. That's one way that God is seeking to sanctify us, to set us apart more and more for His purposes. And, and so, again, that's, that's the nature of these trials. The second thing that I want to point out is the, the duration of these trials. And, and we saw it there at the end of Daniel 11.35 where it says that uh, it still awaits the appointed time. The appointed time or the time of the end, that when it comes to these trials, God only allows them for a certain amount of time. This is, this is similar to what you read in the book of Revelation, where one of the churches is going to go through severe persecution, severe trials, but only for 10 days. That, that, that's, there's a time limit on this. And, and I believe, given the... the uh, the, the nature of Revelation, its prophetic literature, that that is a figure for just a, a complete amount of time. No more, no less. And this shows us that when we are in the furnace, God keeps His eye on the clock. And He also keeps His hand on the thermostat. It's not going to get any hotter than He has determined, and it won't be for any longer than He has determined. It's for an appointed time. Again, this shows us that we're not merely at the mercy of chance. We're not even at the mercy of our enemies. They're only, they've only got so much chain uh, when it comes to this, that God only allows them so much, hitherto shalt thou come, no further. But rather the time that is appointed is set by God. And then uh, the, the other thing 
that should be stressed here. The nature and the duration of these trials. How about the consolation that these, of these trials? And, and that is, God doesn't just toss you in the furnace and then I'll be back later and He goes and does other stuff. Our God sits by the furnace. And there's a sense in which He's even in the furnace with us, right? Think about Daniel, uh, Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. There's a fourth one in there. What? I thought we threw three. There's a fourth guy in there. That God, uh, Malachi talks about how God will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And, and so God, yeah, he, He's right there when we're in the midst of our trials. He's not far off. He's right there with us. This is like Job when he's sitting on the ash heap. And, and where are you? And, and God's answer is, I, I was right there with you. But God is constantly aware of what we're going through. He, he is uh, a caring Father. That nothing that we go through is wasted. Now, does that mean we're going to understand perfectly why we had to go through everything? No. We may understand it better by and by, but this side, we won't understand perfectly. And yet, by faith, we believe, again, nothing was wasted. That God used all of those various trials to, yes, test our faith and produce perseverance and endurance. And then, steadfastness, verse 4, it has its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I believe that, again, these Jewish Christians, they, they knew their Old Testament just like James does. And in fact, James is going to use this character in just a, a chapter and a half. I believe when they read the word test, testing here, they would have made the connection back to the father of the faithful, Abraham. Abraham is the first person which it is specifically stated that he was tested in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. And as you proceed through that narrative, and I know in the theater of our mind we can, we can see Abraham, the old man, he's got the child to promise, that God has said you need to go to Mount Moriah, you need to sacrifice your son, your only son, the son that you love. And we can, we can think about the agony, and, and we can think about, I mean, it took him three days to get there, and just the, the inner turmoil and, and all that. And yet, we see Abram, uh, Abraham, and he is a figure of that perseverance, and that steadfastness, that resolution, that nothing would hinder Abraham from doing what God had asked. That he finally came to the conclusion, we're told in the book of Hebrews, that he believed God could even raise his son from the dead. And so he raises the knife. And the Lord stays his hand. And that testing of Abraham is similar to the testing of the Christian. And indeed it's the if you're working from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scripture, it's the same word that's used there that's used here. Steadfastness has its full effect that you may be perfect and complete. That's where Abraham stood after the testing. That he withheld nothing from God. And in a similar way, we come to the point where we withhold, we withhold nothing from God. That's part of the uh, perfection, the completion. There's also, I mean, again, this is... Uh, James, a Jewish man writing to Jewish Christians. And, and I believe there's a, a deeper sense to this idea of perfection. It can, it can carry the idea of maturity as well. You, you are moving toward maturity in this. And that's certainly, I mean, you make the connection to what Paul writes in, say, Ephesians chapter 4 and uh, things like that. But there's also a sense in which these Jewish Christians who'd, who their whole lives had come up with the sacrificial system and, and all the sacrifices that went into the temple. And now that they're Christians, maybe there's a, a question like, well, 
what are the sacrifices now? And in one sense, Christ, Christ has done all the work on the cross. He's, he's the supreme sacrifice. And yet, isn't it the case that we are also living sacrifices? That every sacrificial animal had to be, ready, perfect. Had to be free from disease and blemish. It also it needed to be complete. Couldn't bring your lame. Uh, you, if it was marred, disfigured in any way. And I think every Jewish Christian then would have made that connection to, oh, I see, I see. You see, God is still looking for those perfect and complete sacrifices. And that's us as Christians. Right? We're, we're slaves, but God, he wants, he wants those holy, He wants a holy people. He wants that holy nation. And then also, I think these Jewish Christians, they were probably familiar with a sermon that their rabbi had taught them. Rabbi Jesus? That Sermon on the Mount? One of the things that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 48, you must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And perhaps those words are echoing in their ears as they hear what James records here. Which, by the way, that's going to happen a bit in the book of James. You're going to hear those echoes from the Sermon on the Mount. Because James, he knew what his brother had preached. And so he continues that on here. Perfect, lacking in nothing. See, that's what these trials bring with them. And indeed, the, the perfection, the completion, lacking in nothing... Well, James, that, that's, he's, he's impressing upon these Christians. That's the aim of these various trials for us. But really, who is the model of that perfection? It's Christ. Christ is the ideal perfection realized in humanity. That Christ is a reflection of the perfect mind of God of what humanity should be, what humans should be. And so... Without that perfect life modeled in Christ, we would have no idea of what a perfect man, what a perfect human should look like. And I believe that's what James is doing here. Is Although uh, he's not specifically mentioned in verses 2-4, through four, he was mentioned in verse 1. And that's the lead off to this whole thing, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's held up as the model of the perfect man, the perfect human. And now here, we know what it is. God, through trials, through the testing of our faith, producing steadfastness and perseverance, and that having its full effect, this is the aim of God when these trials come our way as well. It's to make us look like Jesus. Just briefly, because we'll deal with it more when we get to these verses, but... Um, you come down to verses 12 and following, and James is going to revisit this, this idea of trials under the idea of temptation, though. It's the same word in the original language. Context dictates how we translate how we ought to understand it. But I do just want to say briefly here, sometimes the trials come to us by means of temptation. And those temptations while James is going to focus on the inner life and how we are lured by our own lusts, sometimes it's the devil himself who brings those temptations. Temptations in and of themselves are not sin. It's when we give in to those sins, that, that those temptations, that they become sin. We can't help it that sometimes the devil does come and he knocks on the door. Can't help that. And sometimes it seems like he's able to kind of get the door open, come in, and, and maybe we can't help that. But we can help when it comes to, we, if he comes into the house, don't offer him a chair. Don't fix him a meal at the table, right? We can help that. And so when those temptations come, and again, we'll deal with it more when we get to uh, verses 12 and following. When the devil comes with his trials, um, no quarter. No quarter is given. Mm. 
And, well, one more thing. Sometimes, sometimes obeying God and obeying Christ can produce trials. You see this in the Gospels. When Jesus has his disciples get into a boat and he commands them to go across the sea. And they row that boat right into the teeth of a storm. By obeying the Lord. That's all they were doing. Their Lord told them, start rowing. And they did. And they rowed right into a storm. And in the same way, sometimes, brothers and sisters, we will experience trials when we obey the commands of Christ. That's not a bad thing. Though we may row right into the teeth of a stormy trial, don't row with anger or bitterness in your heart. Don't, don't row uh, with, with any kind of sorrow or complaint in your heart. Row right into the teeth of that storm with joy, knowing that these trials they will make us mature, complete, even perfect. Let's come this to prayer. Lord God, there is so much that we may not understand. And yet, Father, we have put our faith in you, knowing that sometimes there are tests in this world. Help us through the model of Christ. Help us through your Holy Spirit within us to pass those tests so that we may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing, which is your desire for us. May we make that our aim as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.